It was the archaeological find of the century, perhaps the greatest single discovery of all time. Today, Tutankhamun's hoard remains the Cairo Museum's biggest draw. Millions have gazed awestruck at these incredible finds. But these dazzling treasures have blinded generations of archaeologists to a startling fact that could change our understanding of this most famous pharaoh forever. For there is something surprising about the contents of this tomb. If you look closely at that material, you'll see that something like 80% of that material was never made with Tutankhamun in mind. These are not Tutankhamun's treasures, so why are they in his tomb? To solve the riddle, Egypt detectives Dominic Montserrat and Miriam Cook investigate the very strange life and death of Tutankhamun. Luxor, on the east bank of the River Nile. In the Pharaoh Tutankhamun's lifetime, he would have known this city as Thebes, his religious capital and home to the great Karnak temple, devoted to the worship of his own favored god, Amun. This was where the young Pharaoh came to praise the god from whom he took his name, Tutankhamun, the living image of the Amun, and where the Pharaoh himself was revered as a living god. This was also the place where the body of the king, dead at just 20 years of age, began its extraordinary journey into an eventful afterlife in 1322 BC. From here sailed the remains of this minor pharaoh, who should, were it not for a quirk of fate, have been relegated to complete obscurity. It was a short journey across the Nile to the West Bank, the land of the dead, to join his ancestors who inhabited the lavish royal tombs of the Valley of the Kings. By the time archaeologists began to rediscover these tombs in the 19th century, most had been robbed of their contents, but one somehow had been missed, Tutankhamun's. Inside was a dazzling array of everyday objects and golden treasures, gold which never tarnished and which the pharaohs believed touched them with immortality. But for all their fame, this vault and its treasures have only very recently been examined in detail. And the story they're beginning to tell is as rare and strange as the objects themselves. It's been called the greatest archaeological discovery of the 20th century, and millions of people have seen it worldwide. But there's still an awful lot that we don't understand about Tutankhamun's tomb. It's remarkable that so little analysis has been done on the contents of the tomb. Yeah, it's as though archaeologists have been so overwhelmed with the sheer amount of material that they've just described it rather than looking at it in any detail. It's possible that there might be something really odd about Tutankhamun's tomb. What makes this neglect all the more surprising is that Howard Carter, the archaeologist who first set eyes on the tomb, knew immediately that there was something very strange about what he'd uncovered. Carter discovered Tutankhamun's tomb in 1922, after a long and frustrating search in the Valley of the Kings. It was the discovery of a lifetime, a tomb sealed shut for 3,000 years, and a glimpse of an ancient world that time itself had passed by. Treasure after treasure was unearthed. Chariots, gilded sarcophagi, wrapped in the cold embrace of stone goddesses, exquisite thrones and chairs, collections of models and miniature boats. As a result of this unique discovery, Tutankhamun, a pharaoh otherwise destined for obscurity, suddenly became one of the most celebrated of all ancient Egyptians. But Carter remained disturbed by what he'd discovered, as his notebooks show. Carter recorded his discovery of the tomb in 1922 in great detail. These notebooks are a real gold mine. It's only now that we're beginning to fully realize how insightful he was. 
A number of things bothered Carter about the discovery. He knew that royal tombs were usually begun in the lifetime of the pharaoh to allow time for the cutting and decorating of a vast and elaborate series of galleries and burial chambers from the rock of the valley floor. Egyptian texts also made it clear that the finished tomb then had to be filled with personal items from the pharaoh's life, which they believed he would take with him into the next world. Finally, the pharaoh who succeeded had to ensure that this was done and that the funeral followed precisely the required rites so his predecessor would arrive safely in the afterlife and then he could take the throne of Egypt. But this was not how Tutankhamun was buried. You know, just how small and how peculiarly laid out the tomb was in relation to other kings' tombs in the Valley of the Kings. He also noticed a strange pile of debris at the foot of the great sarcophagus which suggested that the coffins inside had been cut down. Could the coffins have been made for someone else, then adapted? In ancient Egypt, this should have been unthinkable. Pharaohs had to be buried with their own possessions. Carter's conclusion was radical. All in all, Carter thought, Tutankhamun had been buried with a job lot of other people's stuff. Howard Carter died before he could discover if Tutankhamun really did have a second-hand tomb. And since then, few archaeologists working in the Valley of the Kings have been inspired to follow up his nagging suspicion. Now, finally, one has. Dr. Nicholas Reeves. He obviously went through all the pieces in the tomb. He looked at everything. He catalogued most of it. I don't think he really fully grasped the the implications of, of, of all of this. And I really don't think anybody anybody has, has done. But why has the world's most famous archaeological find been ignored? I think a lot of professional Egyptologists have considered Tutankhamun's tomb to be rather vulgar, populist, therefore not really worthy of serious consideration. Um, just a glamorous assemblage of material. With, with no historical implications or, or ramifications. So Reeves decided to look beyond the gold and the glamour to see if he could find the other story hiding in the treasures of Tutankhamun. In the mid-1990s, I started going uh, through the material again and uh, noticed that there was, in fact, um, something more to be said about Tutankhamun's tomb. All right. If you look closely at that material, you'll see that something like 80% of that material was never made with Tutankhamun in mind. It was second-hand material which Tutankhamun had um, taken over for his own use. And Reeve's discovery doesn't just affect the smaller finds. It may radically alter our view of the greatest treasure of all. It's the quintessential object of Tutankhamun. You look at it closely, though, I think that the mask was never made for Tutankhamun at all. I think it was reused for Tutankhamun. The reason I say that is because if you look uh, behind, underneath the back of the mask, as it's now displayed in the Cairo Museum, you see that there is a solder mark running down the side of the face, and along the neck, and up and across. I think the face has been replaced. I think that that mask was originally made for another king and reused for Tutankhamun. So who originally stared out from behind the mask of Tutankhamun? Egypt detectives Miriam Cook and Dominic Montserrat are investigating the puzzle of Tutankhamun's tomb. The young king seems to have been buried in an unusually small tomb with a job lot of other people's possessions. Even his most famous golden mask may not originally have been his. So whose was it? Archaeologist Nick Reeves has come to a dramatic conclusion. I think the face has been replaced. I think that that mask was originally made for another king and reused for Tutankhamun. My own feeling is that um, the mask was originally made for Akhenaten. This is an astonishing claim. Akhenaten was Tutankhamun's father and Egypt's most notorious ruler. In his lifetime, he abandoned the old gods and unleashed a cultural revolution that left his country and people in chaos. 
After his death, his successors immediately set about reversing everything he'd done. So why would Tutankhamun be buried beneath his hated father's mask? All good detective stories begin with a dark secret in the past. And in this case, all the leads take us back to the city of Amarna. Amarna, the desert city built by Akhenaten, hundreds of miles from Egypt's traditional capitals of Memphis and Thebes, and Tutankhamun's own dark secret. This was where Tutankhamun probably grew up, in the city at the heart of his father's revolution. It must have been a turbulent childhood, one in which thousands of years of certainty and belief were swept away with ferocious zeal, and the young prince found himself protected only by the rays of the new god, the sun disk of the Aten. Could the fate of this lost city provide the vital clue in solving the mystery of Tutankhamun's tomb? It's time for the detectives to compare notes. Tutankhamun is really pretty important in terms of his family background. Go on. Well, we don't know for sure who his mother was, but she may have been Nefertiti, the wife of the pharaoh Akhenaten, who threw Egypt into turmoil with his religious reforms. And overturned the old gods, including Amun, and moved the whole capital city from Thebes down to this new site of Amarna. Right, and that's where Tutankhamun is born. Not under that name, but as Tutankhaten, with a name honoring his father's god, the Aten, or deified sun disk. And then Akhenaten dies, and within a few years, Tutankhaten becomes Tutankhamun. Amun, exactly. And I think the whole mystery of Tutankhamun's burial lies in that change of name. The boy who carried his religion in his very name had been born into his father's religion and dedicated to the Aten, but by his death bore the name of the old god, Amun. But his father had said that Amun was dead, so how had Tutankhamun brought this god back to life? The detectives set out for the Luxor temple to look for evidence. Built by Tutankhamun's grandfather, it was dedicated to the ancient god, Amun. Yet these are images of Tutankhamun himself, engraved on this temple when he was king. And they show him doing something extraordinary, something his father would have despised. There you are. This corner of the temple is full of images of Tutankhamun. They're quite damaged, though. Yeah, they're not very clear. Although I can make out that it's Tutankhamun. And he's wearing the horns of Amun. Isn't that extraordinary? By wearing the horns of Amun, Tutankhamun was completely rejecting his father's religious revolution. To him, Amun was clearly not dead. But there's Tutankhamun again. He's burning incense. And that's Amun, the yeah. god his father turned his back on. They're returning to the old gods. Tutankhamun's changing Egypt now. But if Tutankhamun had turned his back on his father's religion and restored the old gods, that makes the borrowed contents of his tomb even more baffling. For amongst the thousands of objects stacked inside are many relics from his father's city of Amarna. If we look closely at this throne here, we can see an Arden or a sun disk on its back. Now, this was a symbol of a failed religious experiment that was over when Tutankhamun was a baby. The answer to this riddle has been found by Nick Reeves in another puzzling tomb in the Valley of the Kings, known simply as Tomb 55. This was first found by Edward Ayrton in 1907, and like Tutankhamun's tomb, it was packed with strange objects from Amarna. What I was interested in was, was um, the relationship between Tutankhamun's tomb and, and this odd cache tomb, tomb 55. And it's when I started working through the material again, first principles, that I saw that there was in fact a connection between Tutankhamun's tomb and tomb 55. And that connection explains what had been going on. The items Aten discovered should have been buried at Amarna but someone had clearly brought them back after that city was abandoned. A 
Amongst those remains, there is a clue to just who that might have been. Items from Tutankhamun's own reign are mixed up with the cash. Perhaps he had returned them to Thebes. But who then had buried him with these inappropriate relics of the dead religion of his childhood? That answer may also lie in the Valley of the Kings in a peculiar collection of objects recovered from a site called Tomb 54. It's a whodunit. We need to discover who was in power when Tutankhamun died because they would have been the people organizing his burial. Well, we've got an important clue right here. Well, what is it? It was used to store the leftovers from Tutankhamun's burials. Amongst the torn pieces of linen left over from his mummification were clues identifying his main mourners. And amongst them were jars that had the funeral meals of the mourners. And these show us that there were only a handful of people here at the burial. From these names recovered at this site, two immediately stand out for Dominic. First of all, there's Ankesana Moon, the widow, because you always suspect the widow first in a detective story. And then there's Ai, an older man who's been around the centers of power for a long time, since before Tutankhamun was even born. These were names from Amana, from Tutankhamun's turbulent childhood. Ai had been one of his father's right-hand men, whilst Ankesana Moon was a daughter of Akhenaten and the wife of Tutankhamun. So what was their role in the mystery of Tutankhamun's tomb? The solution lies in the tomb itself. Eighty years ago, Howard Carter became the first man to gaze on this burial place for almost 3,500 years. And the answer to the riddle was written, had he but known it, all around him. So we're right at the heart of the mystery here. This is Tutankhamun's sarcophagus, and his body is still inside here. And we need to find out what was happening at his burial 3,300 years ago. Well, there's a clue in this part of the wall painting. Here's Tutankhamun, and he's receiving the opening of the mouth ceremony. It's a ceremony which will enable him to speak words in the next world and so be reborn. But look who's performing it for him. It's Ai. But that's usually done by the son of the dead person. So Ai is placing himself in the role of successor. Well, it's more than that. This cartouche shows that he's already pharaoh. That's the prerogative of kings. And we know from other evidence that by this time, he's already married Tutankhamun's widow, Ankesan Amun. Here she is. So we have our two suspects right here, I and the widow of Tutankhamun. Away from the heat of the Valley of the Kings, it's time for the Egypt detectives to work out their next move. Well, we know that Tutankhamun was buried with a strange collection of his forebears' possessions relating to the failed religious experiment at Amarna. And we also know that his widow, Ankesan Amun, and I, her new husband and the new pharaoh, are organizing this rather odd burial. So we have our two suspects, but now we need a motive. That motive has to lie somewhere in the past lives of I and Ankesan Amun themselves. Lives that lead back to Amarna. This was where I first thought he would be buried, and the strange tomb he began here holds clues to what brought him back to Thebes and onto the throne. This is the tomb I started but never finished, and it tells us a lot about this great survivor of ancient Egyptian politics. When work began here, I was closely involved in Akhenaten's new religion and lauded his king and his new god on the walls of his tomb. But when the pharaoh died, his people deserted his revolution, and so I deserted his faith and this site with them. I was a realist, not a revolutionary, and he quickly saw that Akhenaten had left a people traumatized by religious persecutions and bankrupted by his suppression of the old temples. To survive, he would have to return to the old faith and the old city of Thebes. The Egyptian temples were the powerhouses of the Egyptian economy. So if someone like Akhenaten comes along and, and, and closes down all the temples and um, takes over their assets, then this is making quite a considerable economic statement, and it is economic suicide. But if I helped Tutankhamun to restore the old religion and the economy, then why did he bury him with so many reminders of his tragic and dangerous Amarna past? The answer, according to Reeves, lies in Tutankhamun's own untimely death. 
After ten years on the throne, the young pharaoh suddenly died at the age of just 20. For I, it was a disaster. He had planned to rule Egypt next, but plans for Tutankhamun's burial were still years away from completion. Well, when you think about the position that I must have found himself in, he, he wanted to succeed. Mm -hmm. And in order to succeed um, to the throne, an Egyptian king has to prepare for his predecessor a uh, proper Egyptian burial. Mm. The difficulty was that Tutankhamun had died young and presumably unexpectedly. I suppose we can assume that there wasn't really time to prepare anything. And so it came as a shock and I was faced with a, with, with a problem. There had been no time to finish or even start a suitable royal tomb for Tutankhamun. So I, it seems, ordered an existing tomb designed for a lesser noble to be adapted. This might explain why the king's final resting place is so small, but so beautifully finished. Now he just had to fill it with the traditional items necessary for the king's afterlife. What does I do to solve the problem that he's faced with of having to give Tutankhamun an effective royal burial? Well, I think he was lucky because um, he was faced with this problem um, at, uh, at the time when they decided already to dismantle the royal tomb at Amarna and ship all that material back to Thebes. Akhenaten and his family had originally been buried at Amarna, but after the city was abandoned, someone, perhaps Tutankhamun himself, ordered his family's royal mummies and burial goods be brought back to Thebes. What they did was to um, bring all the burial equipment um, back to Thebes, put it in a pile. Um, from this pile, they cherry-picked the pieces they needed for Tutankhamun's burial. Yeah. And what was left, what was left over, was then redivided out amongst the uh, people who it originally belonged to. I had to hurry if he was to succeed, and he needed funeral goods immediately. The Armana items, for all their tragic connotations, were available, and so he used them. The treasures of the discredited father would have to fill the tomb of the son who betrayed him. We found out that Tutankhamun was buried with other people's possessions because there wasn't any time to manufacture his own. These treasures would have been destroyed if they hadn't have been kept safe in Tutankhamun's tomb. Tutankhamun's tomb is more than a treasure. For amongst the gold and glory lies the story of a forgotten time. It would be nearly three and a half thousand years before light would shine again on these treasures. And only now are we just beginning to piece together the silent story they tell. The tale of a... Luxor on the east bank of the River Nile. In the Pharaoh Tutankhamun's lifetime, he would have known this city as Thebes, his religious capital and home to the great Karnak temple, devoted to the worship of his own favored god, Amun. This was where the young Pharaoh came to praise the god from whom he took his name, Tutankhamun, the living image of the Amun, and where the Pharaoh himself was revered as a living god. That material was never made with Tutankhamun in mind. These are not Tutankhamun's treasures, so why are they in his tomb? To solve the riddle, Egypt detectives Dominic Montserrat and Miriam Cook investigate the very strange life and death of Tutankhamun. archaeological find of the century, perhaps the greatest single discovery of all time. Today, Tutankhamun's hoard remains the Cairo Museum's biggest draw. Millions have gazed awestruck at these incredible finds. But these dazzling treasures have blinded generations of archaeologists to a startling fact that could change our understanding of this most famous pharaoh forever. For there is something surprising about the contents of this tomb. 
If you look closely at that material, you'll see that something like 80% of somehow had been missed. Tutankhamun's. Inside was a dazzling array of everyday objects and golden treasures. Gold, which never tarnished, and which the pharaohs believed touched them with immortality. But for all their fame, this vault and its treasures have only very recently been examined in detail. And the story they're beginning to tell is as rare and strange as the objects themselves. It's been called the greatest archaeological discovery of the 20th century. And this was also the place where the body of the king, dead at just 20 years of age, began its extraordinary journey into an eventful afterlife in 1322 BC. From here sailed the remains of this minor pharaoh, who should, were it not for a quirk of fate, have been relegated to complete obscurity. It was a short journey across the Nile to the West Bank, the land of the dead, to join his ancestors, who inhabited the lavish royal tombs of the Valley of the Kings. By the time archaeologists began to rediscover these tombs in the 19th century, most had been robbed of their contents. But one 